The story of Joseph is about favoritism, attempted murder, sexual harassment, false imprisonment, fake identities, and all the markings of a really good Hollywood movie. Jacob has 12 sons, and one of them, Joseph, is his favorite because he's the only son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. Now, Joseph and Jacob are pretty clueless as they go about in their own little world. And so when Jacob sends Joseph off to speak to his brothers, he has no idea and is completely caught off guard when he's thrown into a pit one day. Now, his brothers <clears throat> want to kill him, but one brother sticks up and says that's probably not a good idea. So Joseph, instead of being killed, is sold to Ishmaelites, the not-so-distant relatives of Jacob, and he's brought to Egypt, the land of pharaohs and of pyramids, of wealth and abundance. Joseph is sold to Potiphar, and he's promoted to the highest position he can be. Joseph works hard, and hopefully because he's maturing, he does his work with integrity. Even when Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him, he refuses several times. When she grabs him once and he runs off without his robe, she sees an opportunity. She accuses him of rape and he's thrown into jail. Now this is the only instance that I know of where a woman sexually harasses a man in the Bible. In fact, somebody came up to me taking that challenge on and offered up a couple more names, but as I looked closely at the stories, it wasn't sexual harassment, just women using their sexuality to do things. That was a little bit different. This was about power. Now, there are countless other stories in the Bible where men are abusing or denigrating women somehow, and we don't often hear about all of those. But it's there, it was in that culture. And so it makes me wonder why Potiphar's wife could behave in such a way towards Joseph when she's probably experienced discrimination herself. But then I remember that people who bully have usually been bullied themselves, that people who abuse have often been abused themselves. So here this unnamed woman who's only known as the property of a man named Potiphar misuses the only power that she has by accusing Joseph because she's never seen him as a human being. He instantly went from the object of her desire to a filthy Hebrew slave. It's not uncommon, is it, that when someone has been used afterwards, they're viewed with contempt. It shows that that person probably wasn't treated in a healthy and respectful way. Now, I want to pause here for a moment because as uncomfortable as this subject may be for some people, I think it's honestly important that we talk about this in church every once in a while. Because this kind of stuff, it happens. It happens today. It happens around us. People in this world abuse their power in little and big ways because they think they can get away with it. And sometimes they do. You know, maybe we think we're better than a certain group of people or a certain person, and we behave badly because of it. I've been reading in the last few months story after story of people on the Internet who are trying to give voice to their story, that somehow they've been mistreated or forgotten or abused, and they're trying to give voice and speak out about the behaviors. And I've noticed the reaction to these stories. Sometimes people genuinely listen and applaud them for speaking out. But very often, people belittle the stories and points of view because they really don't want to hear how someone's been hurt. For example, there was a lot of conversation that I just caught snippets of here and there about an NFL player who was caught beating up his fiance in an elevator on a security camera tape. And some people blamed him for his behavior, that you shouldn't treat women that way. And some people, of course, blamed her because they said she should leave. And there were people who were upset with the NFL because they found out, among other things, that it was a harsher sentence to have smoked marijuana than to have beat up another human being. There's a lot of things that we need to talk about in our culture. The woman here in this picture 
this next slide. Her name is Emma Solkowitz, and I became aware of her story right before school started. She's a senior at Columbia University, and last spring she was sexually assaulted in her dorm room. And she filed a complaint, but nothing happened. So she decided that starting the first day of school this fall, she would carry her mattress with her everywhere she went until the student who did this to her was expelled from school. And she knew that it might take a day, a month, or she may be carrying that mattress with her up to her graduation day. Well, so far, I haven't gotten any updates that anything has actually happened because of her, because of her actions. So we still live in a culture where people abuse their power and see others as less, as others as objects they can use and abuse and discard. And naming these instances is still tricky because we still want to blame the victim. We still say boys will be boys. But according to statistics, one out of six women in America have been the victim of either a rape or an attempted rape. And while the statistics for a man are lower, it's there. Even worse, one in four girls and one in six boys in this country are sexually abused somehow by the time they're 18, always by someone they know. And these horrific crimes usually go unreported because the people who've experienced this are too afraid to say anything. They're afraid they won't believed, be believed, and they're afraid that nothing will happen. They're afraid they will be blamed. Ultimately, this isn't about sex, it's about power, and it's about how we look at each other. The names we call people, the thoughts we have, the jokes that we tell, even with just our friends. It's bullying on different levels, and it happens everywhere, even in church. I also want to be clear that the stories that happen in the Bible that we read each week, that we do watch as our biblical people mess up over and over again, they lie and they cheat and they misuse their power and they favor some people over the others. The characters in the Bible are flawed. But the story of the Bible isn't how they were faithful to God. It's how God was faithful to them. You don't read the Bible as a how-to manual, but rather as a story of how God is with us as we mess up over and over again and how God still tries to guide and save us in spite of us. So Joseph ends up in prison, and he stays there for a while, forgotten. But over and over again we read this line, the Lord was with Joseph. In the entire 13 chapters of Joseph, we never hear the voice of God, but we hear that phrase over and over again, the Lord was with Joseph. But I wonder if when Joseph was sitting in his prison cell week after week, month after month, if he wondered if God was actually with him. So maybe one of the points of the story is that the world isn't fair, but yet that God is with those who are mistreated and forgotten and abused. And honestly, as the church sitting here, that's part of our job too, is to name bad behavior that I think the church is a place where we should be practicing how to be open and mature and respectful, that we should be examples to the rest of the world of how to treat other people, how to have integrity and honesty and compassion in a world where a lot of bad stuff happens, that we don't stick our heads in the sand trying to be nice, that we don't allow bullies to bully because we're nice. The church isn't about being nice. It's about respect and mercy and healing and justice and maturity as we grow in God. Well, thank goodness there's more to the story of Joseph. Joseph's gift for dreams and interpreting dreams brings him in the presence of Pharaoh. And this is a good Pharaoh. He recognizes Joseph's talent and he appoints him as the one who will be in charge of overseeing the harvest and putting food aside for the time in which a famine comes. And when the famine comes, people come to Egypt to get food, including Joseph's own backstabbing brothers. 
Now the brothers don't recognize Joseph. It's amazing. He looks like an Egyptian. It's been many, many years. And so Joseph has the opportunity to test them, to see if they're still the same old selfish men that they were before. And miraculously, they pass the test. Joseph reveals who he is, and there's a beautiful family reunion. There's reconciliation and forgiveness. And Joseph says the very famous line to his brothers, what you intended for evil, God meant for good. I don't believe that God makes bad things happen in our lives, but rather that God has the power to take, bring something good out of the bad in our lives, that that's who God is. I'm curious today where you find yourself in the story. Maybe you are Jacob, as much as you may not want to admit it, who's often clueless about the people, the way you affect the people around you. Or maybe you're Joseph, a person who's gone through a difficult time but rises above that difficulty. And maybe you see yourself as Pharaoh, someone who likes to mentor and empower young people and watch them grow in power. But I do think we have to admit as a culture where it is we've been like Joseph's brothers trying to get rid of people we don't want, or Potiphar's wife abusing power, or even Potiphar who didn't ask a lot of questions. You see, the story of Joseph isn't just a story that happened 4,000 years ago, but it happens today. We are characters playing our part just like the biblical characters. We mess up again and again. That's why we can never forget that the main actor in the story is actually God. God is the constant and active presence working grace and mercy throughout the whole Bible. God has the amazing ability to take our selfish, damaging, and painful actions and find a way to bring goodness out of it. We learn in the story of Joseph that God is with the forgotten, the falsely accused, the victims, the abused, and the bullied, but that God also works to heal and redeem the abuser that God works to heal and lift up the abused, that God's will, desire, and agenda for our world is redemption, healing, and reconciliation in our lives. This is the story of God, the story of which we are all a part. In closing, we'll see if this works. We have a very short little video clip that I found earlier this week. It is a story, another kind of a Joseph story. We're having a little trouble at the 8.30 service. We have to kind of get around the loop to try to get to it. But it's a beautiful story about somebody who bullied and somebody who, oh, I think we're going to get it. We're going to get it. A very powerful dream. Oh, go for it. Go for it. I'll stop talking. <laughs> She was bullied by me. Um, I remember pushing her and calling her names. Annoying, short, likes to cause problems. She came up to me one day and she, she asked me, you know, you know, why, why Mariah, why, why are you being such a bully to me? And at that moment I realized that it was because I was bullied myself. I had nobody to talk to, and so I, I used that, that anger inside of me to take it out on other people. That night, I had a dream, and in it was all the people that I bullied in middle school, and it was sort of like I was a ghost. In the dream, I felt like I was in the shoes of everyone I ever bullied. When she asked me that question, it made me want to ask her what was going on in her life. For the first time, I realized what the person I was bullying was going through. It made me realize that everyone is going through something. And today, Jasmine and I are the bestest friends. She knows everything about me and I know everything about her.
and it helped me heal from all the times that I have been bullied. She inspired me to dream up a new way of being. Thank you, Jasmine, for helping me be a dreamer. Well, there we go. A modern day Joseph story. Thanks be to God.